So this is what this paper is about, to have a direct measurement of cranial movements on the head. So I'll switch into uh, PowerPoint and share my screen. So this is just a, a journal that it, it came out in, so we can move on to speak about rhythms. So when we think about rhythms in osteopathy or in, the, uh, or in cranial, uh, we come back to the beginning of osteopathy here with uh, Sutherland, who talked about the primary respiratory mechanism. And Sutherland, he, he in, in, around his work, he also talked about three different rhythms, and he called them tides. And it was named as short tide, mid tide, and long tide. It will often show up in many different names, but here we keep with the tides from Sutherland. Many years after Sutherland has uh, described uh, these rhythms, uh, the first attempt came to try to palpate it, uh, the rhythms, and put it into a published study. And here in science, it was giving the name the cranial rhythmic impulse. So often if you see a, a science paper on, on palpation studies, or measurements of cranial movement, it will be the cranial rhythmic impulse. Later on came uh, Dr. Obletcher, uh, also palpating a rhythm and call it the cranial sacral rhythm. Now, if we look, the short type described by Sutherland, and in some cases, the cranial rhythmic impulse and the cranial sacral rhythm that Obletcher is speaking about is fairly in the same range of rate. So we could speculate whether it's the same rhythm we are talking about. Of course, we have to be aware that most of what we have about this is from experience. And we all have our own experiences of feeling rhythms of the body. So we cannot know if what Sutherland experienced is the same as Oblitzer experienced, or if it's the same that is experienced in palpation studies. So we're going to look a little bit into that. I put some extra arrows here because at the dawn of osteopathy and describing the primary respiratory mechanism from Sutherland, um, we can say that rhythms that are related to the expansion and retraction of our head and whole body, it's not something that is new. It's been in many cultures for thousands of years and it's been described in many different ways. So it's not something new, um, but here we are trying just to describe something, uh, a phenomenon we can say, and see if we can learn something about that. So in, in cranial, uh, about the cranial sacral rhythm, we say it's, it's the first step in successful cranial sacral therapy. And in the CS1 class with Obletcher, we, we first learned to palpate both the cardiac pulse, the respiratory pulse, and the cranial sacral rhythm. And we do that as an exercise in CS1 so that we are able to distinguish uh, the three different rhythms on the body to also see that this is how the cardiac feels, even with the hands on the head. This is how the respiratory pulse feels on the head. And now by shifting my focus, I can also focus into that there's another rhythm that we call in operator the cranial cycle rhythm. We also learned that all rhythms can be palpated on the whole body. When we further explore uh, the rhythms, we can learn that there are different aspects to the cranial cycle rhythm. We can talk about symmetry and synchrony of the rhythm, the quality of the rhythm, the amplitude, and the rate. When we move on to the second class, the CS2 class, we are now going a little bit more into what we can palpate in the rhythm and that we can be clear about that there is a flexion phase and there is an extension phase. And in between the two, there's a neutral zone. We call it the neutral zone. Sometimes objects are also call it the uh, idle zone. 
So this is what we are learning to, to palpate. So if we look what we very often hear in, in, when we discuss cranial, especially when the, with the surrounding society and the healthcare, established healthcare system, is uh, there comes up this controversy of the cranial rhythmic movements. Is there truly an existence of a cranial rhythmic movement that is different from the respiratory and cardiac pulses? And second, when we try to give evidence of this and we look at the palpation studies, they report on a wide range of rates for the cranial uh, movements. So it seems like it's not always so consistent what we, we can show about this. And this also gives a problem in studies that the inter-observer agreement is lacking so that if different people palpate the same person, sometimes they get different rates, or even get different rates on palpating um, a person at the same time. And also, one thing we want to clarify is to get a little bit more like an objective measurement on, on the possible rhythms so that we could build knowledge for future clinical studies. When we want to look at a rhythm, it's good to remember that a rhythm is a movement that is affected by a succession of strong weak elements opposite or different conditions. And a rhythm, as we measure it and experience it, is a regular movement pattern in time. When we go back in literature to look at direct measurements of cranial movements. The only study we really have is a study by Viola Freiman from 1971. Viola Freiman had an engineer to build a machine looking like this, looks almost like a torture instrument. Um, and you put your head in here and they put screws on that will transmit the movement uh, to a computer. The machine could not distinguish between the respiratory movement and any other movement, so the, the, the test person had to hold her or his breath and then try to see when there's no respiration, here's the movement from the respiration, when you hold your breath, is there something else? It was not an easy task, uh, first of all, because the machine created a headache uh, on the clients lying in the machine because it was so tight. And also having such a tight screw, what will, how will that affect the movement of the head? And in addition, you had to hold your breath. But there was one of the test persons who was, had a, seems to have a big movement of the head and also was really good at holding the breath. So uh, your Freiman could, could get a really good measure on this person here holding the breath and showing that while holding the wrist, there is a movement on the skull here with a rate between seven and eight cycles per minute. And from that, uh, Viola Freiman concluded that there is some kind of inherent motion that exists within the living cranium. These studies were never continued and, and almost forgotten and, and also difficult to conclude more about it because it was so difficult to measure people with this machine. So what we did was we say, okay, can we have another kind of device where we can get a more objective measurement on many people? So we developed a, a machine where we use some very light sensors on the head and link that to a more modern uh, uh, kinds of computer analysis of rhythms. First of all, what we put on the head, at the sensors, are called servo actuators. So the advantage with them is that you can program the pressure and you can have the same pressure at all times. So even if the head moves, the actuator will keep the same pressure on the head. So we will have a minimum disturbance on the head. 
The resolution uh, of the one we used is one micrometer. That's a very small movement. And this is the range we are looking for cranial movements in. Uh, we used a 10 gram pressure uh, on the skull. Uh, that's a little bit above our 5 gram, but it's still, it's a very light pressure. And we used two sensors and they were placed uh, on each side on the two mastoid processes for this project. So then to the software, that was a more tricky part. Uh, and if you look over on the left here, you'll see that we expect on the cranial, there'll be many different movements. And as you know from the CS1 class, if you put your hands on the head, that at least already now you will be ready to distinguish three rhythms on the head, the cardiac pulse, respiratory pulse, and uh, the, the cranial rhythm. Now in the class and with our hands, we shift our focus. So we focus only on one rhythm, and then we can focus to feel another rhythm. But how do we do that with the computer? Because we need the computer or the software to focus on one rhythm at a time so we can analyze it. And to do that, we use something called a Fourier transformation. So the Fourier transformation will split out the different rhythms uh, like shown here, and then each rhythm will be shown as a bar on this window. Then we can identify, ah, there's two different rhythms here. And then we can click in on one rhythm and analyze the wave pattern behind that rhythm so we can learn something about it. So with the software and the server activators on the head, uh, we spent some years trying to learn what to look for and how to analyze this. So the first question we really want to answer was the existence of a cranial rhythmic movement different from the respiratory and cardiac pulses. The cardiac pulse is no problem here because the rate of the cardiac pulse is far away from the area we're looking in. So we analyzed it at the same time, but I'm, I'm not showing it here. So now I'll focus on showing <coughs> the separation of the respiratory pulse from other rhythms in that area. So this is the Fourier transform signal from the head it's two cycles per minute on this axis. And here we have uh, the, 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 the range of movement, the amplitude. So if we look here, and it's two cycles per minute, so there's one group of signals around five, six uh, cycles per minute. And there's a group of signals starting around nine cycles per minute and then going up. So we have two groups of signals. And to learn about more, if one of them is a respiratory signal, uh, we can first see here the wave. So when we split out this signal, this is the wave function. This is how the wave movement looks on the head. On the body, on the client, we had a, a movement sensor uh, just on top of the respiratory diaphragm. And so we could measure what is the frequency of breathing on this client measured on the body. And here we had a breathing uh, frequency of 16 cycles per minute. And if you take this group signal, this is a rhythm lying and shifting a little bit. It will, the average will be 16 cycles per minute. The reason why you see signals here is that our breathing is not stable when we align. So Maybe my average is 16, and this is the main breathing frequency, but I may slow it down and I may speed it up. And we'll see a little bit more about that. So we can identify that this is the breathing signal. Now we're going to look how does this movement on the head looks. And we can see that this movement looks quite different from the respiratory breathing. So it has a signal and there's like a wave within the wave. Um, and, and one way to look at this is to say, okay, there comes a movement phase, then something is shifting 
comes a new movement phase, something is shifting and so on. The rate here is five cycles a minute. If we go back and look at the, when we try to learn to go more into the palpation of cranial sacral motion, and we see that we learn that we have a movement we call the flexion phase, and then something happens that we call the neutral zone or idle zone. But most common is a neutral zone, and sometimes we even describe it as the rhythm is slowing down or coming more into a kind of pause and then moves on into the next phase. So the idea here is that what we see here is actually what we palpate when we palpate the cranial rhythm that we have a face, and here will be the extension face. We have something that shifts here, and then we go into a new phase, flexion phase. Something shifts and go into extension phase, shifts and flexion phase. So we believe that the signal we see here is actually quite similar to what we palpate with what we call the uh, flexion extension movement with a um, a neutral zone halfway between the two endpoints of that, if we have symmetry. <clears throat> so, what we can identify is two groups of signals that are different. They are different in rate and they are different in the nature of the wave function they show. So, respiratory breathing with a higher rate. And we have another rhythm that we now call the third rhythm because we don't know what it is. And we just say it's a lower rate and it has a different and unique wave function. So now we can distinguish these two rhythms on the head very clearly. And of course, we can also distinguish them from the cardiac pulse. Now, so we can identify cardiac pulse, respiratory pulse, and third rhythm on the head. And we can also identify how much amplitude on the head movement do each of them contribute to. So if we look on the x-axis, we have 50 clients. On the y-axis, we have the amplitude of the skull. In green here, if we look at the green part of the bar, that is the cardiac pulse. So we can see that the cardiac pulse often contributes very little to the head movement. In red, we have the respiratory pulse, and we can see that the respiratory pulse have a major contribution to the head movement. In blue, bar, that is the proportion of this third rhythm contribution to the head movement, and that's also a significant amount. The average third rhythm movement or contribution to the amplitude was 58 micrometers. The average respiratory pulse is a little bit bigger, 88 micrometers, and the cardiac pulse mean was 13 micrometers, so a small contribution. So we can identify each rhythm on the head and how much they contribute to the movement. Now, if we look at different parts of the body, because in CS1, we learned that we can feel this on our entire body. So we put sensors on temporal bone, parietal bone, the finger, and the ties. And this is the cardiac pulse. And we can see that the cardiac pulse will have fairly the same rate everywhere on the body. That's no surprise. But, and we can palpate that in practice. If we look at the respiratory, uh, of course, as in CS1, if we put the hand on the respiratory diaphragm, it's quite easy to feel the respiratory rhythm. But we can also do it on the head and the fingers and the leg. And what we see here that, that the respiratory pulse can be measured and it's fairly the same on temporal, parietal, finger and tie. And just to document that on the third rhythm, the same, the third rhythm can be identified with fairly the same rate on the temporal parietal 
finger and the time. Now, if we look, what will be the amplitude of this third ribbon on temple? So this is the amplitude of the third ribbon on the temple, amplitude on the parietal bone, amplitude on the finger, amplitude on the time. So what we can learn here is that the third ribbon has the same rate all over the body, but it will have different amplitudes depending on where we are on the body. So if we have a free body and we do our listening stations at, as we did in CS1, uh, we will feel it will be the same rate, but with different amplitudes. And then we can learn more that if the asymmetry, we have restrictions, maybe we don't feel a rhythm in a place, so we have high restrictions and so on. But if the body is free, uh, we will have the same rate, but with different amplitudes. So our conclusion to the first question is that in all human tested, here in, for this study it was 50, there is a third cranial rhythmic movement that is different from the respiratory and cardiac rhythmic movements. This third cranial rhythmic movement has a movement pattern different from the respiratory and cardiac movements. And the third rhythmic movement is present on the whole body. Next, we want to look a little bit more about the nature of the cranial rhythmic movements. What is the frequency of the third movement in normal humans? Uh, and is the third rhythmic um, rhythm stable or dynamic over time when we have a fairly neutral environment? And that means they're just lying down on a treatment table without any kind of inter intervention. This shows uh, the measurement in real time, direct measurement in real time. The time axis is here, and it's uh, here 42 minutes, about 42 minutes. And here we have the rate of the third rhythm. So we can say a person is entering a room, there's no therapist, there's absolutely no interaction. They are put in the machine. They're instructed to lie down for at least 50 minutes. Uh, some of the people coming in here, they don't even know what cranial is. They have never received a cranial treatment. They come in from the street, lying down, and now the sensors just measure the rhythm. Um, so with the calibrations and so on, it will be around 40 to 45 minutes. Now we can follow the rate of the rhythm on the head. And we follow this pattern and we can see that it's dynamic, but it's dynamic for this client within a narrow range, going to the lowest of 4.7 to the highest of 6.3. We can calculate the average of the rate, which is 5.42 here for this client. The variance measurement is telling us about how much variance do we have in the rate of the rhythm? So how dynamic will it be? So we can see that it's quite low number. It's not that dynamic here, and we have a narrow range. If we do this for all 50 people, uh, we can calculate what's the mean rate if they're just lying uh, supine. If we look here, we have all 50 clients. And the rate of the average rate of the rhythm is plotted for each one of them. And we can see that nearly all of them is a very narrow range. Oops, sorry. Um, from a little bit above five to close to seven. Then we have a few outliers around seven and one outlier here close to four. So it will go from a minimum of 4.25 to a maximum of 7.02. And the mean rate of the rhythm was 6.16. So it's a, a rhythm that has a very narrow range in humans that are normal, that means without any known pathologies um, that are present and just lying supine resting. And this is the situation that lying supine resting that they will have in our clinic often. If we look more into how much variation we have in the rhythm 
here I've shown three different persons. So we can see the one from before that we know um, is here in the middle, and then we add some, the lowest one here, going down with a very low ribbon, still with a very low variance. Then we can see that the person with a higher rate of the ribbon here has a higher variance. So the higher the rate of the ribbon, the more dynamic. And we want to test, is this something that is significant that when your rate of the ribbon goes up, so will the, the dynamic range of the ribbon. So here we plotted the rate of the ribbon and we can see the narrow range here from five to seven. And here we plotted the variance and we can see that when we increase the ribbon, we increase the variance and it's quite significant. And the reason why we're interested in this is that if we believe that the rate of, or the, we believe that this ribbon is a basic life function, so it will be also linked to our autonomic nervous system that does the rate relate to variance, uh, because when we change something in the autonomic nervous system, that the rate will go out or go up or down. In conclusion, in a group of these 50 uh, humans, the mean third ribbon was 6.16 with a narrow range. And the ribbon is dynamic with a rate variance of 0 0.3 with a tendency to a larger variance with increasing rate. Now left, we have the controversy of the cranial rhythmic movements about the palpation studies that report a wide range of rates for the cranial movements. And together with that, if we don't feel the same rate of the ribbon, we also get into the problems that if two people have to palpate the same person and they get different rates, uh, then it becomes more difficult to use in uh, any kind of clinical study. So we want to look at that. Uh, we even did, we did a lot of experiments where people have to palpate, where we were also measuring. Uh, we even had people where two therapists has to palpate the same person at the same time, and they were blinded, uh, so they couldn't see each other. And then they have to report the rhythm by movement and we record it on video. And afterwards, the therapist could see that you are palpating different rhythms. Um, and we try to, try to find out why are you palpating different rates of rhythms. If we look for a moment at the literature, so this is the palpating uh, studies reporting on palpating, the cranial rhythmic index. And we can see that here we have a study between a rate of three and four, and that's the only thing they find, find, found. And here we have a study where they only uh, found between 10 and 14. So we can say that it's not likely that they are palpating the same rhythm. This study here with the rate between 10 and 4 was by Woods and Woods from 1961. And it was the first study ever published about palpating the cranial rhythm. And it went into many references as books about cranial and so on. So it became like a believing system that this is the rate. Um, if we look uh, at our study, we can say we don't find anyone in, in this area uh, with this third ribbon. Uh, so for sure, it's not the same. If we look here for a moment, we can see that the breathing pulse on the head is actually creating the biggest movement of the three of them. So if you're not aware of the difference in your palpation between uh, the cranium with a neutral zone and so on, you will very easily, if you just says, sit down and palpate, you will feel the breathing rhythm because it's the biggest movement coming to your hands of the three of them here. So what we think is that some of the palpating studies, like the first one by Woods and Woods, 
they were actually palpating the breathing rhythm. And that's why they got a rate between 10 and 14. If we look at different rhythms, um, we, ha we have measured the respiratory rhythm from nine to more than 20, and that's when people are lying down and relaxing on a treatment table. The third rhythm here, between four and up to eight, but they never cross each other. Uh, and I'll show more about that in a minute. Um, so if you fall into feeling a breathing, breathing movement of the head, you will include rates that goes up in this area. To explain a little bit about why sometimes uh, people feel a slower rhythm, like we also saw in the palpation studies, uh, we have the mid-tide described by Sutherland, and the mid-tide is a fairly stable rhythm around two cycles per minute. And we could see that when we have diff different therapists palpating, some will fall into the respiratory rhythm, some will fall into the third rhythm, and some will fall into the mid-tide without knowing it. Um, there was a study published where more than 50 therapists palpated, should do a palpation and record the rate, and like one third of the therapists fell into the uh, a mid tight uh, rate, whereas the other ones fell into a third rhythm. And they only had the instruction to distinguish between the respiratory breathing and the third rhythm, so they avoided palpating the respiratory breathing, but they didn't distinguish between the two of them. In addition, what we learn from seeing many people palpating uh, these rhythms is that sometimes because we are very light in palpation, we, we tune a little bit out the body and maybe we go into different fields. So we are palpating energetic rhythms. And we can see that suddenly people are recording that they palpate another rhythm now. And sometimes that's an energetic rhythm. And we know energetic rhythms very well because we learn to palpate them in CS2. And what we learn to palpate is that we learn to use arcing. And when we arc the waves from an energy system, that's energetic palpation. And we know that the, the feeling of the arc will change depending on the distance to the energy system. So that would be one kind of palpation we sometimes observe that people fall into and then report a different rate. So we have different options. So it's really good to be clear when we teach and when we practice to be to be very clear on what we palpate. There's nothing wrong or right in anything we palpate. It's just to uh, broaden our perspective and, and say, okay, now I palpate this and now I palpate this. So for the crossing of breathing and the third rhythm, we try to use some people who are very skilled in, in uh, relaxing and to uh, calm their breathing down. Of course, if you hold your breath by force, be conscious about it, you can of course stop your breathing. But what we want to see is that if you're just unconscious about your breathing, any rhythms in your body, but you're just relying and relaxing, people experience that they go down to a very slow breathing. And we observe that one thing that is happening is that you really go down to slow breathing, but unconsciously after going slow down, you will speed up your rhythm, uh, breathing rhythm a little bit, and then you slow down. You speed up and you slow down, you speed up, and you do that unconsciously. And the breathing, breathing goes really go down towards the lower rate, but not crossing the third rhythm. In, in studies of the heart rate variability, this is called that we go into a more state of physiological coherence when we really relax. But it doesn't cross the third rhythm. So in that way, we so far has been able to always separate them. We were prepared that if they cross, how can we know which one of them is there? We can distinguish them by the wave function. So we can split the signal out and see, okay, there's the one with the neutral zone and there's the signal without the neutral zone. So our future now is to move into more understand the physiology behind the third rhythmic movement so that we can learn a little bit more about that. We are very clear that, that maybe we will not 
fully understand all of this. So what we are really trying is to describe, simply describe the rhythm. One thing that we really want to do is to see if we can make a link between the rhythmic movements on the head to CSF movements, because that is central importance in the cranial field. So when we look at our study to look at the movements of the head using this Fourier transformation, so we can see different types of movements, we can compare that with other studies doing the same, but in different areas. So the different areas we see here is people doing the same, but in the blood movement and people doing it in the movement of CSF. If we look at the signal we have on the head from the respiratory pulse, we can see that in the same way, doing a Fourier transform on blood, we have here the cardiac, but then we go down, we have a respiratory pulse signal of the movement in blood. If we look at CSF, and this is the CSF pressure difference inside a living human skull, and this was published in 2019. This is the cardiac pulse, and this is the respiratory pulse. So when we see a movement on the head, a physical movement on the head with the respiratory pulse, that respiratory pulse can also be seen as a movement uh, of CSF inside the living skull. If we look at the signal of the third rhythm that has a slower rate, we can see that in the blood, it actually has a quite strong movement signal inside blood here identified. Looking at CSF, they cut off the diagram here and they describe that they only look for differences between respiratory breathing and cardiac pulse on the CSF movement because they didn't expect any other um, rhythmic movements there. But what they saw in their data was that there was uh, rhythms with a lower rate that actually created a CSF pressure difference inside the skull and a CSF movement. So we are looking into that now to see if we can create that link between the movement of the third rhythm and the movement of CSF inside the head. So having developed an objective approach for studying this third rhythm might form the future basis for clinical and physiological studies of cranial circuit function and dysfunction. My acknowledgement, this is uh, my partner, Carl Christian Möllingrad, who worked on developing the machine and spent a lot of years and time on that. Here are uh, people contributing. It's Geert Brug Landewehr, who did a lot of clinical manuscript reading. We got money from the Danish Cranial Association and we got some funding from the Danish Science Foundation. We got some money from the Oblitzer Foundation. And then we had a team of diplomat certified uh, cranial workers in the Oblitzer Denmark. It's Helle Wolf and Birgitte Dat and Jana Stilhoff. They did a lot of palpation showing up for volunteering work so that we could palpate and do a lot of testing between therapist and machine and try to get both parts in alignment. And thank you very much to you for listening here on your evening in Australia. Thank you very much, Thomas. That's fantastic. Really appreciate that. Uh, we, we're just, um, would you like to um, uh, take some, some questions there now? Uh, that people have already started putting a few questions through. Um, but uh, would you like to just have a look at the, the, those questions as we move into the Q&A section? There's someone going in to uh, Amy Shanks, uh, talking about the professors and doctors of osteopathy for the studies on Michigan State University uh, for, for the Retzlaub and Oblitzer and Mitchell and also citing Russian papers that studied uh, the pulsing of uh, cerebral spinal fluid. Um, 
you can say that what we have been looking at in, in the different studies, you can say the problem is that when we want to compare what we actually palpate, that you can say the Russian studies was done, you can say, with an indirect te technique where you are looking uh, for CSF brain movement. And that's quite easy today. There's many studies and you can see that on, on modern MR scanners, how the brain is pulsing and what is pulsing according to. So there's no problem in that, uh, but there are different movements. But we can say that when we go inside the skull uh, for that part, then we go back to the controversy again, because cranial states that the sutures is open and that the whole head will move with CSF movement. And most of the established, um, established uh, medical science says that's impossible because the head is rigid. So that's why we can say we focus so much on saying we have to measure it outside as a physical movement because otherwise we go back to the controversy. We know the brain is moving with this and we have all the pulsings of the brain. The other part is that we, uh, the, the study is done at, at Michigan State University. Actually, when we go, go back and look at the original studies, it, wa it was a, a PhD student who did the, the, the studies on what we refer to as the RAID. Uh, and, and in reality, it was done on one monkey. Uh, and it was with, uh, in a very different setting. So, in, so we can say that was Dr. Oblechter himself also concluded that they didn't do a study on measuring the rate uh, of the skull in that way. It was published as an abstract to um, a conference and, and there's been some papers also, but original study is not something that we can compare with. Okay. So that's the main focus here to say that all the brain pulp uh, palpation studies and so on, that we need to link that to the head movement we feel by hand. Okay. So that was the main idea. And that's why we say the only study that did that directly was the study by Rural Freiman. I hope that is a satisfying question to you, Amy. There's a question saying, was there only one person measured? And, and we say for this study, this paper, uh, there was 50 persons measured. So I, when I took one person out was to show the example of the real time um, measurement, how it looks when you do one at one person, but it was 50 person measures in this study. And in total, we have measured hundreds of persons now. So, um, and can you di discuss the change in the rhythm of, from trauma, um, coma and age? So we can say that in our study and what we have seen, there's no relation between the rate of the rhythm and age. There's no relation to the cardiac pulse. Uh, there is some kind of relation, not to the rate of the breathing, but towards the variance in breathing. So we can say a stressed person will have a very superficial breathing, uh, often with a higher rate. A relaxed person will still have a kind of respiratory breathing, but it will be very dynamic. Uh, so you can you can shift your breathing rate when you have this dynamic range when you are relaxed. And there's a correlation to that. One of the reasons why we looked very clearly into correlations between cardiac, respiratory, and the third rhythm uh, to see the relations is that if we have two rhythms like and the example would be in music. If I play one tone here and one tone here, the wave interference will create what we call a beat frequency. So you can hear a third tone, but it's created by the two other tones. Um, and we are looking into that kind of phenomenon to say, okay, the argument that the cranial rhythm or the third rhythm could be created as an artificial or along the way beat frequency of the other rhythms to rule that out okay. and it's not it's its own it's purely its own uh, rhythm for coma uh our lecture did a, a, a palpation study on coma patients 
and 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 that's the only thing uh, we know that it seems that in coma patient the the rate of the rhythm is slower we have not measured bigger groups of people with pathology but we have measured people with multiple sclerosis and here we also have seen uh, a slower rate we didn't have enough to conclude anything about it yet because it's it's still case studies running and so we cannot conclude on a on a bigger group uh, yet so it seems that that's a disease of the central nervous system and somehow that affects the uh, the movement in there so the rate becomes slow um, for other groups of pathology of course it's very interesting to study it but we can say this study is like our first step to go into that kind of study because three years ago we actually started to do the clinical studies and we realized there's so much we don't know and to be able to know how to use this in a clinical study we simply need to know more about it um, so this is uh, for the future we have done two more studies that are coming out this year one study is about all Sutherland's cranial rhythms because we try to learn more about the rhythms to see how they are related together long tight mid tight and this rhythm uh, the other study we are, have finished is where we took this group of people who haven't received uh, CST treatment, maybe they have tried a little bit of manual treatment uh, or none, and then we compared with a historical group. Uh, so we took a group of people that has been long-term treated with cranial and just to see is there any difference in any of the things we can measure. And there is, if you are long-term treated, you, your rate of your rhythm will go down, you'll have a slower rhythm, uh, your breathing will change, your breathing pattern will change, but most important uh, to what we see in physiology today and diseases is that the amplitude of the skull is significantly bigger in people who have received cranial treatment. And with going on with that link we are working on with that the, this movement is linked to CSF movement, then we can say that to have a healthy brain with all the development we have in our world of neurodegenerative diseases like the whole spectrum of dementia, that if the circulation is going down, we see an increased development of these diseases. And if we can prove that cranial is moving the amplitude of the skull, we have already proved that now in the study, but to link that to CSF movement, that is giving a new link for what cranial is good for with, with some good evidence. Okay, there's someone here. Sometimes I feel that breathing <coughs> and the CSR becomes exactly the same rhythm. Any infos about that? Yeah, that's a very interesting experiences. And, and actually, um, when I teach cranial, I always teach uh, one way to get into a still point. And that is that we feel the breathing, or we feel the, the cranial rhythm on the ties. We just sit with that. And then I start to synchronize my breathing with um, the cranial rhythm. And when we go into still point, we can say what happens is that in reality, the rhythm doesn't stop. But what happens is that we have a, a, what we call physiological coherence. And in physiological coherence, we have that uh, breathing and is very close to our uh, cranial rhythm. And when that happens, they become close to each other and that's an experience uh, and you feel them going coherent. Um, so they got they get close to each other, but they, as far as we can study, we cannot see they become the same. But we have did a lot of practice to synchronize, try to synchronize breathing with cranial rhythm, so that we experience they become the same. But what happens is that they become very close, and then we go into a more state of coherence. And we also feel that in the client, uh, with our hands on the client, when they go more into this relaxed state of coherence. It feels like there's no rhythm or they become coherent. 
I hope that answers the questions to, to Peggy. The question, what is the next step in research? Uh, we answered that from Tor, from Peter. Uh, it's been said that the cranial sutures don't actually have any micro movement and it's the fluid pulsation that we feel. Any comments on that? It's for sure that if we look at uh, the real modern MI uh, uh, scanners, uh, they document that the sutures fuse. Um, and the fusion of the sutures uh, is quite strong for some of them. And some of the futures, or sutures, they fuse uh, at the, uh, for example, the, between occiput and spinoid, that's quite central to us, is fusing at the age of uh, puberty. So it's hormone related. And when we go into puberty, that will fuse. Uh, sutures around the temporal bone seem still to be the one suture that, that seems to be able to stay open in, in life to very old age or even in our entire life. So, so we can say that uh, what we feel that that still the, the bony skull has some uh, flexible movement and whether that is created by CSF or any fascial uh, movements uh, on, around the head, uh, we don't know yet. Uh, of course, at one time point, what would be a study is to see if someone has some artificial pieces from operations on their skull, so they have some kind of metal in bone, it will be interesting to see a scanning of that because there you will actually be able to see very precisely if, if there's a movement to bone itself or whether it's what, how much movement comes from fascia and fluids. So I, I will keep that an open question, but for sure, uh, some sutures seem to be having a strong fusion um, when looked at modern MI scanners. Um, maybe what we feel is just as to be open is that when we feel the, uh, and tune into our palpation, at some level we palpate also the, the, the pericranium, that is the layer, outer layer of the bone that is fascia, whether you say it's bone or whether you say it, it's, it's a separate fascia, but it's the fascia that is the bone fascia on the outside of the skull. And, and that seems to have, a, when you palpate it, a very clear movement. Um, and that fascia is more tightly bound to the sutures. So when you palpate that and you feel a shift in that fascia, you feel a rapid change in movement. And maybe that's what we palpate in the suture. That's just an open suggestion. And there's a reference points also to the older studies uh, of 10 years that have shooters that the sp uh, spinoids and uh, the sagomas connection with the frontal bones are not fused. So, yeah, and I guess our whole shooter discussion is our problem is that, that we, we may have individual differences, but we also have that maybe some of the shooters are not fusing and others are fusing. So, um, I can recommend if, if people are interested to read more about the sutures that, that the more modern studies come from forensic science because forensic science really went into, uh, they have a lot of money we don't have in cranial. So they spend a lot of money time on, on very advanced uh, MR scanners too because they wanted to know uh, in forensic science to, of course, determine the age of, of, of a dead and do that in many different ways. So, so they looked at suture fusion, if they could, that could be a part of determining the age of the dead one. Um, so yeah. So that could be interesting to look at if you're more interested in that. Um, If the machine uh, might be helpful for, for students uh, learning to feel uh, the rhythms, um, 
Yeah, and I think, luckily, that when we teach CS1, when we change the, the, the exercise with changing focus on the different rhythms and be more clear about that, one, one thought is that we, we spend some time on that to be very clear. Uh, we can say that if the, if the machine could be brought down to a very simple Carable device that was cheap, we in future could could bring it in to say now we can actually monitor the rhythms of this person. Um, that will be interesting, but that that's not where we we at. Uh, add to clarify about I refer about to all the encompassing. Research of the cranium at Michigan State University by the three professors. Um, go back. It's for uh, Amy. I come back to a question. So, Amy, I I see your your question, um, and we can say that. There's a whole and very long study when it comes to both sutures and rhythms and all the controversies. So, but it'll be a very long discussion, but you are welcome to write me and we can also meet on, on Skype or anything and, and discuss because the list of research is quite long. Recently at the Oblitzer Institute, um, there has been, we are going through all the literature and there's a long list showing um, the evidence or publications for all kinds of views on, on also on the sutures and that. Um, so I'll recommend also to look into that, but you're very welcome to write me also um, because the different kinds of studies done are done in very specific terms. So, but I'm happy to discuss it, but, but maybe for time we should, we should uh, meet uh, for that. How does Alzheimer affect the brain rhythm? Um, we can only say we, we don't know. We know that for Alzheimer, the idea is that, that the circulation uh, of the liquid is being reduced and, and uh, for several reasons, for like contaminating uh, proteins uh, or for stress, because stress relates to the lack of sleep. And, the lack of sleep does not allow us to go into a relaxed state where we open up for the liquid circulation around the brain. Uh, but how it affects the rhythm, uh, we don't know. Would you consider your research to fall within the area of human biofield science? I'm also wondering about the concept of quantum field theory and the idea that the mere observation of something can change its function and structure. Um, yeah, I completely agree that we can say that this study, we can say is quite um, experimental based and we tried to do it very physically uh, for the movement of the head to get clear of the controversies about the rhythm. That was our main purpose. When we talk about treatment, what happens in treatments, what we experience when we, when we palpate, that is a completely open box. And, and, and I think in, in the legacy of Dr. Oblitz, I say to stay completely open uh, we have only observed something physical here uh, to document that in a study. Um, but when you go into the idea of when we observe, when we connect uh, with someone, we change, we change what's there. And we have actually seen that in when we were trying to get the machine to work in the beginning and trying to go for the clinical studies directly. One of the big hassles was that as soon as the therapist entered the room, it changed. So just the intention of the therapist and, and coming into the room, and when people put hands on, everything changed. So we can say that that will be within the uh, within the bio 
uh, field and, and something that, that relates to something different. And of course, that is something that we, I guess we all experience in the treatment room and something else happens that, that we can't measure in this way. We can see a disturbance, uh, something happens. Um, it's like when we, we can say that when we go into the room and the significance detector turns on, something is happening, there's a process going on. And, and just the case that there is an observer change what's there and what happens. So. In one context, in, in what context is the Oblix Institute doing work? Any connection with the university, hospital or private clinics? So we can say one strategy that we try to use with this is that to be able to get in contact with your university groups because that's where you have often the equipment and the money is to say that by making these very simple and fundamental studies about the rhythms to say, okay, we have something that could be interesting to study in physiology because we will not have the, uh, the resources to do physiological studies in this alone. So we need to connect with universities to do that. But by having this, um, it's, this paper is easier for university environment to, to understand and to say, now we can build a study for this going more into the physiology. And Gerdin Doyle says, so what I heard you say is still point the CSR does not actually stop. Is this correct what I heard? There is more coherence in the system. Yes, Gildin, uh, we can say that if you look now when, we, when we, we, we say that the cranial rhythm is a physiological rhythm, it exists physically. We also sit back and it's, it's both experiences from people and something uh, Dr. Oblitz also spoke about is that if you can sit with someone who, who is dying and you can feel the cranial rhythm after the cardiac and rhythmic pulse has stopped sometimes. So it, it points out to us that, and, and as we talk about this, as a very basic rhythm of the body, and we can say a basic physiological rhythm of the body does, it doesn't just stop. Like the, unconsciously, the breathing will not stop, the, the heartbeat will not stop. And like that's this very basic physiological rhythm will not stop. So in everything we have measured, uh, people going into still points and all kinds of these experiments, the rhythm doesn't stop. But what happens is there comes a major shift in the body in the still point that goes into coherence. In that coherence, for some reason, as a therapist, we don't experience the rhythm. The same if you are, uh, if you do a still point on yourself or you're lying on a treatment table and someone doing a still point, you, you feel the stillness, you don't feel any rhythm. You don't feel the breathing rhythm in the still point. You don't feel the cardiac rhythm in the still point. It becomes still. So we don't experience that anymore. And why that is so, uh, we look for different explanations because the, the still point study is the one we are active on now. We can say one thing that can be happen. There are some theories about when feeling rhythms that when a therapist and a client connects, uh, we will go into the same. We can, so if we really connect, we will go into the same rhythm, so we don't feel the rhythm anymore. That's one idea. Uh, another uh, idea from, from uh, the nervous system reactions is that we have something that is called the psychogalvanic effect. And that is, if we have a reaction in the body, uh, we can say, like we learned in SER, that something is important for us, uh, we have the significance detector. The psychogalvanic effect is that if we have some uh, arousal or something happening to us on an emotional level, um, we change the skin resistance, so called psychogalvanic effect. So when you're palpating, that there will come a change in the tissue uh, all over the body and we will feel a difference. 
A third idea that uh, I like myself is that when we feel a rhythm, you can only feel a rhythm in time. So you, to feel a rhythm, you need the time axis. When we tune into a different state, so when I change my brainwave pattern uh, because of state of consciousness, so when I, I sit in touch and I, I tune into a different field, and when I change my consciousness, there are other states of consciousness that are timeless. So if I move into a timeless consciousness, then I don't have a linear time anymore. And without time, I don't feel the rhythm. So that's another different kind of explanation. We, of course, we don't know the, what's the truth is in this. It's just to give uh, explanations. And we are trying to learn more about it. So we have a question from Ripa. Uh, the cranial cycle therapy books mentioned that the primary respiratory mechanism as the reason for the CSR. Can you describe what is the primary respiratory mechanism? So we can say that the primary respiratory mechanism was described by Sutherland. Uh, and you can say that some put into textbook that there's a primary source of, we can say this, uh, expansion retraction and, and 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 this kind of respiration you will find it in 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 old Tao literature you'll find it in, in the in the vedas you'll find it in in old in, in very old christian books from the so so you you can find it in in you can say in all our cultures way back that we have this this kind of different kind of universal breathing that is not our respiratory breathing uh, so we will always feel this expansion, retraction. Some say of the universe, some say of the God. And in osteopathy, you can say Sutherland came into this primary respiratory mechanism. Then then has been said so many words about it and so many ways in textbooks because it it's, it's depends on our culture and where we come from, how we put words on it. But for me to make it simple is just to say that if you tune into your body on different levels, you will feel an expansion and retraction. And the idea is that this expansion retraction lies behind all these body movements. So everything will be uh, just a, a wave that, that comes as a consequence of this. Okay, then comes Amy says the primary respiratory mechanisms is not the reason for the CSR. The CSR is one aspect of the primary respiratory mechanism. Um, I will, yeah, my answer to Amy is we can say that when you read different books, you will have different opinions. And, and to be honest to you, when it comes to the primary resp respiratory mechanism and what is the reason. Uh, for, for it or not, I don't know. Uh, and, and to be honest, I haven't read many opinions about it, but I've never seen anyone who actually uh, knew about it. And, and of course, I can see also when you, when you go into whole uh, biodynamic field, there are, are many explanations for this. Um, and you mentioned also Magoon, I know Magoon, and, and there's, there are very, extensive books about this and and all about it is based on experience so so what you experience might be different from what i experience or Solomon experience so we get an an experience and some of these experiences can be more difficult to explain but we try to be uh, put words of them when, when it comes to the primary respiratory mechanism i don't know what it is i can feel it and and if it's the creator of the cranial cycle rhythm or not, I, I don't know. Um, we can say it only comes down to a, this study that, and, and, and that's our lack of knowledge, uh, is that we have only done an 
objective measurement on the head movements, basically. Uh, and, and that's where we start. Um, and at the same time, I, I can feel and experience the primary, primary respiratory mechanism, and I can read all the books of Sutton and the Magoon, but, and, and I can go back in time to study Tao or, or the Vedas and so on, and, and see the same description in many ways. It's different words, but, um, but uh, I don't know what it is, to be honest. And, and I don't know if I will ever find out, um, but I'll keep experiencing it. Okay, I'll close that, uh, Shane. Um. Thank you, Thomas. That, it's really great to, to, uh, to, to get some positive news in, in these times. Yeah, uh, so I, I'd just like to, to thank everybody for in attendance tonight. Thank you all very much for your questions. Uh, and, uh, and thank you so much, Thomas, for, for sharing this information with us. Thank you. Yeah, I just thank you. And whatever you got out of this, I hope that you take only what you can bring into your heart and hands. And I hope you'll stay good in Australia. And hopefully we meet in physical person, that will be much more interesting. We cannot only discuss with each other, we can put hands on and discuss what we feel or experience. That's sometimes more interesting. Yes, I think there's a lot of us that are all longing to, to get back into the classroom and, and uh, apply this practically. Yeah. yeah, and thank you for all the questions and comments. I, I don't believe I have the truth. I listen carefully to what you say and, and I learn from all your questions. So thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas. And thank you, everybody. And, and we'll, we'll leave it here and have a, have a great evening and, and stay safe.